spoken to who's been very, very excited. Uh, some of the uh, uh, sessions we attended were so amazing that there was uh, standing or carpet room only. Uh, and everyone, uh, I look forward to chatting to everyone further tonight when we have the dinner and the dancing and the music and the, yeah. <laughs> When we get a party. You know what though guys, it's um, now an absolute pleasure for me to introduce our special keynote speaker. We're going to be speaking, Dan Moon is going to come and speak with us in a moment. Dan was a really big highlight at last year's AFAC for, uh, conference and we're really lucky that he was available for us for this weekend. He's flown all the way over from Wellington in New Zealand to join us and he's going to talk to us about enhancing community resilience. Um, and, and also about what emergency management um, can learn from the vanilla ice. So please give a warm welcome, from CFA and SES type welcome, to our presenter, Dan Nelly. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and thank you to CFA and SES for bringing me out here. Um, it is really a, a real honor. Um, and thank you for Fran thank, thank you to Francis and Lee to, for organizing everything. Um, today has just been really inspirational from my point of view. Um, I start off with Craig's vision of how we need to be moving more progressively in this community engagement uh, collaborative space to Francis's uh, presentation that I got to see around how we can better use data to evolve our sector, to Gwyn's presentation on uh, the importance of vulnerable communities, and Tom and Tammy right now to talk about different models that we could use and, and different approaches. So um, I think that's been really great to see so many topics being presented, but what's amazing right now is when I look up and see 500 plus faces um, around from people all over uh, Victoria, who are really interested in working with communities, I think that's really quite amazing. Um, I think there's more people invested in emergency management here than in all of New Zealand. So, um, I want to what I want to do is hopefully share a little bit of our journey um, because I think that's what we're all on is this journey of how, in this kind of emergency management space, do we start engaging with our communities a little bit more uh, better, more better, more proactively. So. My presentation is really what can we learn from um, emergency management, sorry, what can we learn from vanilla ice, and I'll get to that point in a second. But a few years ago, we amalgamated all of the local councils in the Wellington region, there are nine of them, and after the Christchurch earthquakes, our, our mayors realized, wait, we got, maybe we should have a you know, shared approach, because what we had were nine emergency management offices doing things uh, 10 different ways. And so we started amalgamating into, into one a body, so we had one, one shared vision and one shared approach. And our, new, um, and our new manager at the time, he said, you know, if, if we're going to really invest in this community uh, resilience idea, then we need to invest in the capacity of this organization. And so he took a really unprecedented approach and put a third of the organization in this community space. The question I had when I had became the manager of this team was, how, as emergency managers, do we enhance the resilience in our communities? Because there's a lot of what's out there that community resilience should be this and that, but there aren't a lot of how's. And in New Zealand, um, that piece in the yellow, a resilient New Zealand community's understanding and managing their hazards, that was actually our national legislation back in 2002, which was quite progressive a long time ago because they're talking about resilience, they're talking about communities understanding and managing their hazards. We might change that to risks nowadays. But a quite progressive piece of legislation that's, you know, what, 13, 14 years old now. But there aren't any real guidelines on how we go about that. And I think as a sector, we have a tendency to focus a bit still in that response space. And so when my team and I started getting together, what, the first thing we thought is, maybe, the, maybe what we need to do is actually map out what does a resilient community look like? And that's what we did. So we came up with kind of a few criteria written in the present tense. Uh, the first of those is our communities are connected and work together towards shared goals, right? That idea of connectedness and working together is really fundamental um, in the research and it's really fundamental in our approach. Individuals in existing social structures are engaged and empowered to make a difference. Our communities have clear channels of, of communication to link into resources before, during, and after an emergency. Um, they have realistic expectations about the levels of support available during an event. I think one of the things that uh, we've done unintentionally in, this, in our field to a degree is almost create a dependency on communities relying on us. And if we look at something like a large scale event, um, the, the, the data shows that we're not going to be there 15 minutes after the earthquake happens. So, you know, we really want to start reframing our community's expectations. Our private, public, and community sectors are prepared to respond to an emergency and return to business quickly. 
Our communities have strong and trusting partnerships, and that's a real, again, a real fundamental for us. Our communities are able to reduce the impacts, right, that idea of disaster risk reduction. And importantly, our people feel a sense of place and belonging in their communities in times of stress. And when an event does happen, they want to stay, right? They want to fight to stay in their community. And that, again, is kind of a, a, a real baseline for us. So when we look at what is a resilient community, these are kind of our starting points. But what it doesn't do is answer the how for us. So how, you know, how do we go about getting to this point? And I, I think what, as a, as a kind of a pivot into getting us to think about this, a few years ago I came across this quote in Time Magazine. Nancy Gibbs, the editor, wrote this. We are living through the most immense transfer of power from institutions to individuals in history. And this quote really resonates with me because I was a former history student, and I think we're living in one of those pieces of history right now where we can look back maybe 2005 with the kind of invention of, of Facebook and the melding of the internet being on people's phones to, I don't know where we're going, when this is gonna end, or I'm sure it will never end, but where you can kind of draw some lines, but probably a few more years in the future, with things like Airbnb and the shared economy, right? Where people are bypassing the middleman, right? No, you know, is everybody familiar with Airbnb? Right, like Airbnb has a greater valuation than Hotel Hilton, and they own properties around the world, but Airbnb's worth more, and they've only been around a few years. So when you look at how these dynamics are changing in emergency management, effectively, I think we are the middleman, and and, this, and the communities are starting to act, you know, effectively work around us. And that was no clearer for us than in February 22nd, 2011, when we had a big earthquake. Um, the story of the Student Volunteer Army, is everybody kind of familiar with that? So if you look, like none of these students in this picture had any emergency management training, right? Nobody had any interest in emergency management, and yet, when the event happened, they were able to self-organize on a Facebook page with thousands and thousands of people in a day and start proactively doing things with their communities, right? We, they weren't actually connected initially to the emergency management structure. This guy took all these pictures. This guy, except for these last two, I mean, um, this guy was an accountant from Auckland who drove down and helped set up a welfare center in the community. Had no emergency management experience, never went through a welfare training program. He just did what he thought was right, loaded up his trailer with a bunch of food and a barbecue, and went to go help people. This lady was working in the community center before the event, right? She was helping her community every day, and when the event happened, what did she end up doing? Helped her community every day as best she knew how, which was go back to that community center. She donned on a vest that said free hugs, and that's what she was doing, right? And, and so I think the, the, the I raise this because these, all these things were happening without us, and they were doing great things. That brings us back to the question of how. How does the command control model and training and mindset help us enhance the resilience of our community? That's kind of what we're trained to do, and we're trained to do response well. And, you know, and that's a big, important uh, breadbasket of our work program. But if we're going to get serious about working with communities and this idea of community resilience, I don't think we're actually given a lot of that training. So I want to tell you a little quick story about my past on American right we'll talk about ourselves. And um, I, was able, I, was a, I was a Peace Corps volunteer. Has anybody ever heard of Peace Corps? Right, so I was a Peace Corps volunteer. John F. Kennedy started in the 60s, um, takes young idealistic Americans and sends off to developing countries to help out, right? So I got, I got really quite lucky and I landed in uh, this little village called Iskaran in Honduras. And for those of you that don't know much about Honduras, it is the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, right after Haiti. It, is, it currently has the world's highest murder rate above uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. And right before I arrived, Hurricane Mitch had blown into town and taken the lives of 20,000 people and displaced a million. And that was kind of my introduction to Peace Corps. You go through a little training program, they teach a little Spanish, they teach them community development, and they're like, high five, we'll see you in two years, let me know how that works out for you. <laughs> Seriously, that's pretty much how it works. Um, and so they, you know, they put you on a little bus and you end up in this little village and you're, you know, you're, you're young and enthusiastic and idealistic and you start wanting to work with these communities. And so when I looked around, I saw all this trash, right? Trash everywhere. People take the trash, they dump it in the river. People take the trash, they dump it on their, you know, around the community. And it's, you know, there's, there's a fair bit of trash around. And so, you know, being young and excited, I was like, okay, I, I see the problem, right? The problem is, is trash. That's something I can do to affect positive change. And so I came with this idea, like, what this community needs? some trash cans, 
<laughs> so I, I went. I found some small funding to get these trash cans built, and you know, I identified the problem, and I identified the solution, I identified a work program, and I even painted those trash cans. The lettering you see is the stencils that I made, and I did all that work, right? And it was great. To this to this day, I maintain it was a really good project. Unfortunately, the community didn't see it as a really valid project. And this is a picture of a dog crapping next to my trash can. <laughs> And I took that at the time because I thought it was a really nice metaphor for how badly this project failed. And I still keep this picture in my office because I just think that, like, this really summed it up in so many ways. Um, the problem is the community didn't use the trash cans. Why didn't the community use the trash cans? Any ideas? Because trash wasn't a problem in their eyes. Guess who never even bothered to ask the community what they thought, right? Because I, I identified that problem. And this is when the light really started going off for me that maybe, maybe there's something around like how I engage at the outset which might impact you know, the, the outcomes downstream. And so you know, I was a little bummed out for a while and uh, the community, for some reason, they said, hey, Danielle, do you want to you know, get involved in, in our Mango Festival? And I was like, yeah. So they've got this big thing called the, the Mango Festival every year. And what they wanted to do is use this Mango Festival as a way to kind of grow publicity about their little village so people would come visit and spend some money and you know, it was all cool. I said, yeah, absolutely. So rather than run into this with all kinds of ideas, which I had, I actually looked at some of the community development stuff that Peace Corps had given us and said, yeah, you should use this, this is good. Um, I actually looked at it and took it seriously a little bit more for the first time. And I came across this thing called asset-based community development, which is you start with, when working with communities, you start with what they have, not what they need. Right, because people always need more stuff. If you go in going, okay, what do you guys need to solve this problem? There's a list of things that they will come up with that they need. If you turn that question around and say, what do you have to solve this problem? It actually changes the way that people start thinking about it. So I sat in this community group, and you know, they're coming up with all these ideas, and I kept asking the questions. I didn't say, okay, guys, let's do asset boost for fulfillment. I said, okay, you know, start asking questions. What do we have for this festival? And they came up with mangoes, which is great, right? If you're going to have a mango festival, we have a lot of mangoes. That's a good starting point. We had a lot of sugar cane, which is the core ingredient for rum. And rum is always good for parties. So we, we were already off to a good start. And the other bit that we had a lot of is donkeys. We had a lot of donkeys in my village. Has anybody ever hung out with donkeys before? They're the worst animals going, man. They're just, you know, the term ass, right? They're an ass. Like, it comes from this animal. Um, and so we were, you know, we were sitting around eating mangoes, drinking some rum, and we came up with it like, what can we do with these donkeys? And we, and we kind of came up with this idea, like wouldn't it be funny if we had a game where the gringos could play the Hondurans on donkeys? And we're like, yeah, man, that'd be rad, right? Because Hondurans grew up riding these donkeys, so they know how to do it. Gringos, not so much, right? And so we came up with this idea of donkey polo. <laughs> And it was a total hit. It was a total hit. Around, you know, you know, the news from around Central America were coming and actually filming this. And I can say this with a straight face, 14 years later, it's the only project that I had that's still going strong. <laughs> Two years of my life, I spent in this little village, right? And it's the only project that's still going strong 14 years later. And why is it going strong? Because at the outset, I started asking, what is it that we can do together, right? What do we have? to solve this challenge, not what do we need? And I didn't kind of start throwing things at them, I just kept asking questions. And so I think that's a really good metaphor on you know, the importance of how we engage, because are we gonna go out there and build trash cans, or are we gonna come up and do donkey pull-up, right? Because really, how we engage matters, and I just can't stress that enough. I've been failing in community development now uh, for 20 years. I, I'm a community development person who just happens to work in emergency management, by the way. Um, I've worked around, I've worked in disasters around the world, but I still consider myself first and foremost a community development person. And so, when I, that was one of the things when I came into this sector, we got all this training around, you know, AIMS, what you guys call AIMS, what we call SIMS, what the Americans call NIMS, like a lot of good stuff, not, I'm not discounting it, but it doesn't, you know, how, is, how does this training help us create a resilient New Zealand where communities are understanding and managing their hazards? And I think there's a big disconnect because that's the vision of our, of our legislation, and yet all the training we receive is like, you know, kind of Rambo stuff. So this is where I think the sage of community developments comes into play. You guys remember Vanilla Ice? Right? He was kind of popular like 25 years ago. He had one song. What was it? And what was the opening line to Ice Ice Baby? 
There it is, right there. Stop, collaborate, and listen, right? That's it. That's all you need to know when you want to go work with communities. Like, seriously, that's it. Vanilla ice, you pretty much nailed it. I probably would have turned that around and said, listen and collaborate, but you know, he's from Texas, you can't, can't, can't knock him too much. So, so, what we've done in our, in our team, in the Community Resilience team in Wellington, is we've kind of come up with this communicate and collaborate model for community resilience, right? So it kind of runs in parallel with command and control. It's not trying to supplant command and control, it's just kind of some, you know, the command and control is great 1% of the time, but communicate and collaborate is kind of a more effective model 99% of the time. And it kind of works like this. This is our emergency manager in the red dress, right? She's out there working with communities, and what she's doing is we're spending time just hanging out with our communities and bouncing around and listening to their ideas, and they get good ideas, and what they do, and we're, this is theory a few years ago, by the way, and we're three years in, and it's actually working quite well, is these people go, you know what? Here's, I, you should meet Bob over here, because he's got a good idea, or he's got some you know, connections, and they keep introducing us to more and more people. And three years in, we are pretty well connected by just going out and listening and getting to know our communities and building on their ideas. And I represent this a bit squiggly because I think, you know, it's, communicate and collaborate is more of a, is more like a plate of spaghetti than it is a nice clean org chart. Sometimes there's dead ends, it's winding, um, it's frustrating at times, but, you know, ultimately I think it builds good outcomes and that's, and that's kind of our, our really professional approach uh, in Wellington. So I think, you know, as a starting point, resilient communities, if that's the goal, one of the things we really need to start doing is building community development principles and tools and methodologies into the emergency management engagement process. So once we kind of, once we started developing this strategic approach, we put some guiding principles in place. And I think this is kind of an important point. If you take away anything out of this presentation, it's, it's probably this slide. Um, the, you know, some of the things that we're doing, first and foremost, in capital letters, is listen first. Right, we don't want to go build trash cans. Don't go build, unless that's what your community wants to do. Um, but you don't want to just charge out there and say, I've got a great idea, we're going to do this to communities, right? Because it generally doesn't probably get a whole bunch of traction. And so the next one is really supporting local ideas. I'm sure, you know, I know downtown Melbourne is going to be way different than Creswick, and the, and the, the factors and all the drivers behind those communities are going to be different. And you're going to, we need a, a range of opportunities and a range of solutions. Uh, we need to be able to encourage ownership. Uh, so, you know, 14 years later, two years of my life dedicated to that community, the only thing that they're doing is Donkey Polo, but you know what? They own it. They own it, and it's become like part of the core identity of that town. Uh, but, but most importantly, no matter what we do, if, if, if you can't walk away from that and have that kind of sustainability going, I would posit that there's not a lot of value in that. We need to be focusing on end users right from the starting point. What matters to them? Uh, we need to be informed by evidence. I've already heard some great presentations today. Uh, I don't think that's something our sector particularly does. At least uh, we're getting better about it, but there's a whole bunch of great research out there that we can be drawing upon, particularly in this community development space, where we'd be drawing on years and years of research and good, uh, good solid methodologies that, that work. Uh, I think we need to be more collaborative across sectors, so we're trying to work more with our urban planners, our community development teams, and a range of people that are non-traditional partners, right? But they're, it's not just out of the emergency management sector that we're working. We want to really, really kind of focus on strong, healthy communities. And I think that's one of the things Craig was talking about this morning. All of that allows us to innovate and go weird. And that's one of the, our team models is go weird, right? The weirder the better, probably, because that helps capture people's attention and imagination. And these other ones, eight through 12, that's all about building trust. And you know, I've already heard that a few times today. One of the most important things around social capital and working with communities is, is the fact that they trust you and that they trust each other. So if we're you know, aiming for all that stuff, um, that's pretty good. And then number 13, of course, is have fun. And that's another, I think, growth area for our sector, right? We're a little bit dismal at times. Um, and so what we're doing is really trying to find ways to be a little bit irreverent and fun because people would rather go to a party than they would you know, a funeral. Right? Even if we're talking about sad stuff, um, like disasters, you can turn that stuff into a party. So our model kind of works a little bit like this. Uh, we came up with this term, community-driven emergency management, because in New Zealand, I don't know if you know, we're, we're still hanging on to that civil defense term, which is like, you know, 1957. So we're just trying to kind of prod that along a little bit with a new way of looking at it. So we're calling it community-driven emergency management. Um, 
And where in the past, I think we've done a lot at the household and individual level, we've tried to expand our scope and put more energy into working with community leaders. So that's principals of schools and uh, just a range of people that can affect change. So we still have a range of things that we do um, at the household level, but we're trying to put more emphasis with the change makers. And at the top, it's also part of that creating a mindset shift within the top levels of our, of our organizations that we're here to support communities. We're not here to do things to them when the response actually happens. So our approach is really built around three C's uh, in our community resilience strategy. That's build capacity, increase connectedness, and foster cooperation. And what I'd like to do is kind of walk you through some of the, the theory behind what we're doing and then some of the tools that support that. So this very first one is build capacity, right? And if you look at any kind of community development strategy anywhere, build capacity is always in there. And like I said, we're a community development team working through the emergency management lens. So that's about improving knowledge and skills and resources to help out before, during, and after emergency. And some examples of that is our community emergency management training. In the past, we used to call this our civil defense volunteer training, right? What we've done, though, is over the years, when we first started putting this together, it was very club kind of approach, right? It's very team focused. And what we were found is we were turning people away if they weren't committed enough to our cause. And philosophically, we should never, ever, ever turn anybody away if they have the energy to come and want to help be part of our solution. So what we've done is started at every opportunity, stripping back the barriers for people to get involved. Um, and now what we do is, we actually do that emergency management training, it's more akin to a first aid class, right? It's kind of like capacity building. We're teaching people skills on how they can help out in their community, and at the end of that process, we go, okay, does anybody want to be a volunteer? Right, so we're turning that around so we can create touch points, because a lot, one of the things we were also doing is we were turning people away, like if they had criminal records. We're saying, sorry, you can't be part of us. But, you know, these people are in our community, and they're gonna be, you know, they've got energy to help out, so what we're trying to do is every time somebody comes to us, we're able to channel that energy instead of turning it away. Uh, and, and I'll just touch on one other point. If you look in this, um, the diversity that we've had improved from this approach has been remarkable. So the guy in the bottom right-hand corner, he's from the Philippines. Uh, the lady in the far left corner, Fijian Indian. Dutch dude in the back, uh, English guy, and I think the lady in the middle is an actual New Zealander. Uh, but it actually speaks volumes to our approach because 60% of, of the people that come through this training now are foreign born, which is really quite game changing for us, right? We're really engaging with those communities that have been traditionally hard to engage with and getting them on board and they're kind of owning what we're doing. Um, another thing is we're starting to work with the private uh, sector a lot more. So uh, we, you know, people want these grabbing, you know, these emergency getaway kits, they're really expensive. So we went and partnered with an organization to make them, letting them use our branding. And they went from 180 bucks uh, to now they sell these for 75 bucks, and we've sold 25,000 of these in the last uh, four years. So you know, that's, and then same thing with these water tanks. Those cost 265 dollars. We partnered with another company, and now we're selling those for like 100 bucks, and we've sold six or seven thousand of those. Which is really, from an earthquake resilience point of view, that's really quite you know game changing, moves the needle a lot of ways. So I would urge you to, where possible, look to the private sector to help you solve some of these problems. We have a big tsunami risk in Wellington. Has anybody heard of our tsunami blue lines? It was a, so it kind of went like this. Um, one of my community, actually my suburb, uh, approached us and they said, "Hey, what are we going to do about this tsunami? What are you going to do? This, you know, what are you going to do about this tsunami risk we got?" And I was like, "Not much, right? I'm not going to go out and like stop tsunami. I'm not going to do that." And they're like, "Yeah, okay, that's fair." Well, we should be raising awareness about the tsunami risk. I was like, okay, that's cool. How do you guys want to do that? They're like, oh, you're the expert, you tell us. I go, well, here's what we can do. We can put signs up. I can nail signs up, I can do that tomorrow for you. Because we know where the maximum run-up height roughly is gonna be, right? We've had all this computer modeling. We know where the, the, the rough maximum run-up height's gonna be. We can do that, or we can do something else. Because I told them, I said, look, there's a bit of an evidence base that that, that type of signage gets lost in the background after a while, and people don't see it. I said, so if you guys want, we can try and develop something entirely new. Your choice. And I said, let's go with the weird approach. I said, all right, let's go with the weird approach. So over the course of a few months, we meet in our, in our suburb um, over drinks, and we come up with a lot of ideas, right? And we came up with a lot of bad ideas, bad ideas. At no point did I ever say, that's a bad idea, right? I always said, that's cool, how are we gonna do it? And they kind of go, oh yeah, we can't do that. In the end, somebody said, wouldn't it be cool if we could just paint 
uh, a line around the whole suburb that showed where the maximum run-up height is. It's like, we can do that, because I work for the company that paints lines on roads. It's a city council. <laughs> <laughs> and so we treat it as a pilot project. Well, I always treat, thing, always treat things as a pilot project. <laughs> it's less scary to the people up above. It's a pilot. It's, we're just going to try it. So, so we tried it. We painted blue lines on the road, and there was, Ben probably remembers this, uh, there was huge uproar, right? And we knew that. And, and from my point of view, like, couldn't buy that kind of marketing for a bazillion dollars, right? Couldn't buy it. People to this day go, what a dumb idea. So, you know, the water's just going to, you know, all I have to do is get right behind the line, and the water's going to tickle my toes, and, you know, I just have to, <laughs> to run to the Tamer Street, and, like, I'll be fine. But what they're doing is telling me, whoops, they're telling me exactly the action that I want them to do. Right, and that's the game changing component of that. So again, we've done studies on this and you know, the tsunami awareness, we, we've compared suburbs and the tsunami awareness of where people need to go is through the roofs in cities or in the suburbs where these are at. And now after Japan, these actually went in place one month before Japan. Um, everybody's like, bring these, you know, we know you can know where to go. Now they're seeing this kind of value add thing. And so it's been a really effective tool, but the thing I would stress to everybody here is it wasn't my idea. It was never, I could have never, I was, I'm nowhere near creative to come up with this. What I did is just create the white space for the community to come up with these types of solutions, right? And I just, I kind of kept people at bay by saying, it's a pilot project, right? And so that's how we treat it. So anyway, oops, um, we still have a lot of public education materials. We try to use good behavioral psychology where possible. So if you look on the, we have one for neighbors, the, this one's for households, and this one's for businesses. Um, the biggest words here are not get prepared for the emergency, are they? We're saying the biggest words are it's easy, right? So we're stressing, like we're trying to use good behavioral psychology in the, in the way that we approach things instead of trying to say, get prepared. Um, so those, all, any, anybody can pick this up and work through it. It's a little action plan template that you can work through. Um, what we're trying to do is create something that we don't have to spend as much time at the household level as we did in the past. We try to create some tools that people can use so that we can kind of free up more time to work with community leaders. Um, and we have another one with resilient schools, so we've created an online system for our schools to enter in their emergency plans, and we're working a lot more with the principals, and I heard uh, some talk about this earlier, around training the trainers with the teachers. So, you know, it's, we still go to the schools and, and do a lot of great work, but what we're trying to do is, is leverage a little bit more ownership at the principal level, right? So the principal can drive the, the, the muscle memory of doing evacuation drills. Um, and again, this idea that we don't hold all the answers, right? So one of the tools that we have is that our communities have better ideas than we do, and that is a tool in and of itself, right? Just having the white spaces of the rules. And this idea of yes and, um, that is a philosophy we've taken out of improvisational comedy. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the, the, the methodologies we train, but I put my staff, uh, and we're doing it right now, we put them through improvisational comedy training as emergency managers, why? Has anybody ever seen, the, remember there was a TV show in the 90s, uh, it's called Whose Line Is It Anyway? Does anybody remember that, right? So the idea is you can never say no. People throw stuff at you, you just have to roll with it. And if really you think about it, that's what emergency management is, right? What we're taught is process, but what emergency management really is, is improvisational comedy, right? And, and this idea of yes and, and I say that literally and figuratively. Um, but so is community development. So my team, you know, it's not like they're not allowed to say no, but really putting the forefront of when somebody says, you know, I want to do this, we're like, yes, and this is how we might go about it, or there's another idea, right? And it changes the framing, so we're always trying to work with people. So the other two are around this idea of social capital, and I think everybody's probably familiar with it. Social capital is the ties that bind us, and this is really fundamental to our approach. So. When we kind of, as emergency managers, got into this emergency management, sorry, community development space, we really wanted to frame it as we are partners of other people doing community development, right? I don't want to become a community development team by itself. And so there's a whole bunch of things that we can do to support other people um, because all those other community development activities build resilient communities. So um, these are the things that, whoops, these are the things that support that we can create and strengthen relationships um, of our diverse communities. Um, one of them is the idea that we are a networker and a connector. So minimum two hours a week, my team are required to go out and hang with community members, different organizations, private businesses, um, with no emergency management agenda. I don't, they're not allowed to really, I don't want to say they're not allowed, but like they shouldn't be talking about emergency management. All we want to do is go and hang out and, and understand like, what drives our community. So 
you know, not long ago we went to one of the Buddhist temples and they, we did a meditation exercise, right? So all these emergency managers rocked into the Buddhist temple and were like, oh, we're gonna learn, you know, meditation. Um, because we wanted to understand, like, what is the Buddhist community all about? And so they, you know, they fed us and we, you know, we, we broke and bread with our Muslim community and we, we, we actually just, we spend time out in the communities without any agenda, focusing on what drives them, not just trying to push our agenda all the time. I think that's really important. So coffee, dream coffee. Uh, we support a lot of community events. So Neighbors Day, um, we have this thing, you know, here's one where we ended up loaning a bunch of radios to one of our festivals. They needed radios. Uh, you know, we're like Rambo headquarters in the back. We got all this kind of crazy stuff and they need some radios. I was like, yeah, take some radios, man, go for it. Uh, my, my boss was like, I don't know what on that's such a good idea. They're just sitting in a box, right? Might as well use them for something. Might as well help this community use them for something. Um, these guys are big champions of us now, right? They love us. Um, another one is, this is a good representation. You know, the two groups in public education that we have the hardest time connecting with are youth and college communities. So I think one of the things that we do in emergency management, we're like, we need to get people more excited about preparedness. And I think what we need to be looking at is, actually, we need to get more excited about what the communities are doing. And so one of this is a bunch of university students organize a downhill cardboard race. Right, it kind of falls on deaf ears. Falls, falls on deaf ears with me a little bit as well. Right, it's not really my gig. But if that's what, if that is what brings hundreds of people together, then that is what I'm going to get excited about. So they approached us and said, "Hey, we throw some advertising on our Facebook on your Facebook page because we put a lot of community stuff on our Facebook page." And we're like, "Hell yeah, we will!" And so if you look, that's my organization at the top of the heap. They're out there talking. You know, they actually were passing out some of our material to the youth. Who's who? When, when, the, when a university student, who's going to influence a university student more? The emergency manager or another university student? Right? Who, who do you trust more? You, you know, your friends or, some, or somebody that tells you to do something that you don't know? Right? Even with the uniform, which carries a fair bit of weight, there's a lot of evidence that says your friends have a lot more influence over you than somebody that you don't know. And so here's our community. Here's our community doing our work for us at a downhill cardboard race. I just can't stress that enough how important it is for us to realign ourselves with what the community is excited about, not trying to get the community necessarily excited about what we're trying to push. And there's a combination in the middle, but I think there's a lot more room for us to grow into getting excited about downhill cardboard racing. Um, we use social media quite a bit. Uh, this is kind of an old slide, but we actually have, I think now, 48,000 people following us which makes us, as I'm told, we have the largest Facebook following for an emergency management office in the world, or at least one of them. 10% um, of the entire Wellington region is following us on Facebook. Um, every day we're engaged, we have, you know, we have a direct line with 10% of our entire community. And we post stuff like this, which has nothing to do with emergency management whatsoever, right? It's about going out, closing off a section of town and riding your bicycle on the streets. When we started doing this, a lot of, we got a lot of critique. We're like, that's not what emergency management uh, Facebook page is about. And I said, emergency, what we try to do is build strong communities. So anything that builds strong communities is what we're going to put on this page. And if you look, 184 shares, 516 likes, has nothing to do with emergency management. Compare that to what was not long uh, previously, one of the biggest earthquakes we had, 113 shares, 400 likes. Right? So people actually like a lot of this kind of strong community stuff. And I think there's a place for us to be in that space, which we've kind of nutted out for better or worse. Um, another thing we do, whoops, I just want to point it out. Um, we sign our name to everything. So the community knows us. And, and I think that's really important because we're not just this, we're not just this kind of uh, government organization. People know us and, and we, like, it's because Wellington, everybody knows everybody. Um, people have started to come to us and say, oh, you know, you're Dan from the Emergency Management page, and, and different staff members kind of, people know our different kind of way we post, which is kind of uh, cool and spooky at the same time. Um, this is another, again, for each one of these, we have that tool of yes and. Um, the last one is foster cooperation. So the first one, that, that, that other one, increased connectedness, that's the stuff that we support, right? We don't lead any of those activities. We support those activities. This one, this is stuff that we bring people together and we lead. Um, so, that, that build you know, good emergency management, social capital, and, and capacity. And the thing I'm most excited about, of, of all the tools that I'm gonna talk about, this is the one I think is most exciting for us. We've been iterating this concept for the last, oh God, over four years now. And it's this idea of community response and resilience planning. It started off very much focused just on response, but we've actually drawn a golden thread all the way through to 
we are bringing these community leaders in communities that are you know, from three to 12,000 people. And we bring the community leaders together and we are working through a process with them that not only helps them respond to a large scale event on their own, but we're also looking and starting to do a bunch of community building activities across the recovery environments of social, you know, the social built, natural and economic environments of their suburb. And we're starting to bring our mayors along they're signing off, and it becomes a partnership. And I could, I'm, I could yak about this for hours, um, but this, I think, is the most exciting kind of tool that we have. And we've developed a whole toolkit, and we're very happy to share it if anybody's interested. Another one we're doing, and I talked about this a little bit with, with Gwen's presentation earlier, um, we work very closely with social agencies, right? The people that are going to be looking after your most vulnerable communities are probably going to be uh, the people in the organizations that are going to be looking after those communities post-event. And so what we know what we need to do is build up their capacity and their capability. So some of that's BCP planning and so on and so forth. Uh, we work really closely with our, our universities. I think that's a really huge resource for us. Um, we are really blessed to have the Joint Center for Disaster Research located in our community, um, in our city. And again, yes and, right, the last tool. So uh, ra rather methodology, and, and I'll just kind of close, if I don't have this in my presentation, but this whole like, this whole how piece, it's really how we engage, right? So what we try to do is create a way for people to engage across a whole bunch of levels. If all people want to do is like our Facebook page, I think that they are 100% right. I, I think they're totally, I don't want to say totally prepared, but they're, you know, they're a lot more prepared than I think what we've traditionally given them credit for. So what we're doing is, is really employing good community development principles, tools, and methodologies uh, when we work with our communities. And what's not in my presentation, maybe I think this is maybe one other thing that's worth writing down, is I'm going to give you five community development methodologies that I would encourage you to look into. And the first one is appreciative inquiry. And that is a, that, that idea of asset-based community development. Appreciative inquiry is a methodology that if you follow that methodology, it's really inspiring for people. And just like the name implies, like you start from what you appreciate what is already taking place. Right? And you inquire, you ask, like, how do we go forward? And it's a really, really powerful tool, um, appreciative inquiry. Another one is design thinking. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that. It comes out of the Stanford Design School. In many respects, design thinking is kind of the opposite of project management. What people do in project management, you come up with an idea, you kind of build a project plan, and you get to the end point, and, and then what happens often is, then that is uh, delivered to an end user, and the end user goes, oh, this is not what I wanted. Right? You see a lot of companies doing that. Um, and so design thinking turns that around, you actually start to understand your audience. Before you, if you're gonna develop a product or service, um, design thinking is really good because it helps you understand who your audience is and what drives them. And you involve them in a very iterative process. And so you're constantly, it's kind of fail quickly methodology. The third one is facilitation training. Um, I really encourage, if you're gonna be working with communities, go through some facilitation training. It really might, it's, it's probably the thing my team has benefited from the most that they'll say. It's actually going through a structured process on how do you facilitate well. Um, another one which starts to get into the real hippie space, and we've done it, we've done a few courses on it, is storytelling. Right? It sounds like, whoa, what storytelling? But like, when you look at great speeches and when you look at what motivates people's stories, and it's a really great way to help show why you want to do something. So there's good structures on storytelling. And that last one, which I already talked about, is improvisational comedy. That whole yes and um, methodology is really, really powerful. By learning, you know, we've, we've been working through it. You're not allowed to say no. You're not allowed to say but. You have to, you have to always say yes. It doesn't have to like, immediately jump to, oh my gosh, we're overcommitted. It just it helps bring people along in a positive way. So um, that, I just wanted to kind of touch on, I think those are five methodologies on the how that we found really, really beneficial. So we've written a community resilience strategy. A lot of this stuff is in that uh, community resilience strategy. It's online. Uh, we've been really fortunate that the uh, IRDR, which is the integrated, uh, I can never remember what it stands for, integrated research for disaster risk reduction as part of the UN. Uh, they've recognized this as an international center of excellence. So that, you know, that's kind of cool. Um, well, we've also developed the resilience toolbox.org, which is still in a beta version at the moment. But what we really recognize is, and I've been reinforced today. Everybody here is doing really cool things. I want to learn from you guys. I really want to learn. I've heard already a bunch of cool tools that you guys are uh, doing the flood safe program that I heard uh, Francis talking about earlier. Like These are things that I think we can all learn from each other because what's happening is we're all trying to learn this stuff, right? We're, it's kind of, we're, we're all learning together and the less we have to reinvent the wheel, the better. And that is me. Oh, that's a, 
It's actually a Photoshop version of me on vanilla ice face. I don't know, I don't know how much time, if I'm over time or under time. So there's a few minutes for questions. Five minutes for questions. I'm sorry? I don't know, I haven't been back. I haven't been back to Honduras in about 10 years. I, I need to, I, but I still talk to people, and yeah, it's still, still run. How are Facebook? Yes. doesn't like those ideas. It's a challenge. And I think, I think we, the question was, how do we deal with a bureaucracy that doesn't like this stuff? Um, I think you need some of those catalysts, like a big fire or a big earthquake, to help shift that, uh, that mindset a little bit. It certainly helps. I don't think you need to have it, but I think the sectors are evolving. I mean, I've seen, I've been, in, I've been here in, in this sector now for six some odd years, and I've, I'm seeing it turn very quickly. So I think it's just I think it's happening, just not you know not as quickly as a lot of everybody in this room is on preaching the choir. So you know you guys all see the value in this. Any other questions? Thank you guys very much. It's been a real honor. Okay. Thank you very much, Dan, for that fantastic presentation. Uh, another round of applause for Dan. Um, so shortly we're going to be um, we're going to be adjourning. There will be three breakout sections se sessions. Sorry, um, that'll that'll be on. And have a look in your handout book. There's some really great sessions. So make sure you tick off those. But if you need to check into your rooms, you might want to do that. So either now or after the optional breakouts, uh, you should go back to your accommodation, whether it's here on site or, or off site. And, uh, and check in, but be back here for dinner at 7. Now there's heaps of information, so don't move and listen carefully. Um, for those that are staying in Ballarat, the address to your, for your motel is on your briefing pack. If you don't have that, then please sing out. Um, if you plan to have a drink tonight, then uh, there will be buses that will leave. Or if you're not drinking, you don't feel like driving, you can use the bus. And there'll be two buses. Um, the, the two Ballarat motels, will be at 6.30 p.m. and they'll be leaving from those hotels. So it'll be back to Ballarat for now or soon. Then if you want the bus back here, it'll leave the motel at 6.30 sharp. Does that make sense? Right. Oh, and don't forget, don't forget to your bring your sparkle. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. CFA. Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh. 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 Alright, so all the drinks tonight are uh, at bar prices and it is cash only, but there is an ATM upstairs in the foyer. Uh, right. But a reminder, <laughs> consider your drinking options well. <laughs> um, it is a very early start tomorrow. We need to be...